Facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. and welcome to Commons Current Events Roundtable. Today we have a, such an amazing guest who has been on our show before and hopefully he'll be coming back over and over through the years from now as well. And that is Senator Adelaide Stevenson III. Welcome. Thank you, Suzanne. Welcome back to our show. And I know that you wrote uh, this wonderful book, which I'm going to read a little bit from, The Black Book, and our, our show is really going to be very timely. It's going to be on politic, politics then and now, and how they have changed. And I just want to read this one little part from your book, which I, I thought really, uh, really is what it really is all about. And this is called Your Black Book. I love that, The Black Book. Politics is the noblest of callings with more potential for good and for evil than any other. And the Black Book reflects a politics all but forgotten in which winning was not the only objective of a campaign. In a democracy, one must win well to serve well. The purpose was to inform so the public could make an educated judgment, trust the people, trust their good senses, their decencies, their fortitude, their faith. Trust them with the facts. Trust them with their great decisions. What wins is more important than who wins. That's what your, your father, Governor Stevenson II, said. And as President Grover Cleveland put it in 1887, who your great-grandfather, great, that's Adelaide Stevenson I, who was vice president under Grover Cleveland, what is the use of being elected of re or reelected unless you stand for something? That was a really great comment, and I really enjoyed reading that. And that's something that uh, we got away with in, in our in our prior elections. That was what's been going on in our elections today. And you know, what do you think, uh, uh, Senator uh, Stevenson? What what needs? You said that. And I know that you're the CEO of the, um, I want to make sure that I read this correctly, you're the <laughs> chairman of the Adelaide Stevenson Center of Democracy, and that's in Metatawa. I say Metatawa, and you say... <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know which you, you have a different pronunciation Mikawa. of that. Mikawa, yes. But it's, you know, it's right next to Libertyville, or it could have been, it's still a Libertyville. Um, and you have amazing programs that, that I attend, and uh, I think they're, they're really good. And we're going to go over some of the shows that you do there, some of the presentations, some of the lectures, and the things that come out of it. But I want to really work on what is missing. And, you know, we talked, you know, we were talking together at the Bluegrass Restaurant today, which, which we had a wonderful meal. and. What's going on? You said there's no partisanship. What do you mean by that? Let's tell the viewers what you mean by that. What's going on today? Well, in the, the uh, Senate in which I served back in the 70s, early 80s, there was no partisanship. We divided over Vietnam. We divided over all kinds of issues. There was partisanship, you meant. During, no when, you were, part, when you were there. No partisanship. No partisanship, okay. There were <coughs> conservatives. Yeah. Uh, there were liberals. There were some who were for the war in Vietnam, mm -hmm. some who were against the, uh, but we didn't divide along party lines. The center was very, very broad. My uh, 
colleague from Illinois, for example, was Chuck Percy. He was a moderate. Oh, he yeah. was a personal friend. And he, he, I remember he lived in Winnetka, and he was a Republican. He was a Republican, and I was a Democrat, and we worked together. We were friends. <clears throat> that Senate has gone, and I think we see excessive partisanship now in all branches of government. Mm -hmm. The House of, House of Representatives, I can't speak for all states, but we certainly see excessive partisanship here in Illinois. So you mean that people don't know how to work with each other like you did with Senator Percy? I think he came from Kenilworth. I think I said one yes, that, but I was. think he's from Kenilworth. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so you didn't have or everybody just stayed in their little corner and everybody kind of worked together as a team to get things done. That's right. What what's happened? What, why don't we? Why do we have? What's going on? What's what, what's, what happened to our politics? The, uh, the 70s was a transitional decade in our, our politics. The media uh, became more episodic, more visual, and more expensive. And the money began to pour in. Party organiza organization began to break uh, down. And um, uh, the whole process broke down. And it became sort of a contest for money with uh, the media un un unregulated. The FCC is almost irrelevant now, the Federal Communications Commission. It focused on the sensational, not necessarily the truthful. Uh, I remember you know, running for governor in 82 against a uh, really strong, highly qualified uh, uh, candidate. Wait a minute, I said 82, this is yeah, you did. 70, you were, I meant yeah, 74 you, for the okay. Senate okay. against Bill, Bill uh, Burdett. We discussed issues, serious issues, seriously, all across the state, and the media wasn't interested. Imagine, five days before the, uh, uh, before the election, the League of Women Voters ho hosted in Chicago uh, the last of our debates, and no media turned up. Because there was no sensationalism. No, we Maybe were discussing serious issues yeah. seriously. There was, no the issues there was no Stormy Daniels. <laughs> the people wanted to hear about the economy, they wanted to hear about education, and they wanted to hear about, about these issues from serious candidates who more likely than not would agree on most of the you know, issues if they were both you know, rational and not uh, ideologues. That's all uh, behind us now. Think back to the primary, the presidential primaries in 2016. Who was the candidate ranked first for lying? His name is T-R-U-M-P. And who was ranked first for truthfulness? That was Governor O'Malley of Maryland. And who just disappeared from the television. O'Malley, television focused on the liar because that was sensational. That kept up, like they thought, um, their you know, ra uh, ratings. And then, uh, of course, he wasn't elected by the people. He was uh, elected in the Electoral College. The same as um, <coughs> George uh, President W. Bush. Dr yeah, pr yeah against uh, Gore. Gore won more popular votes. Mm -hmm. So the Stevenson Center on Democracy, uh, in addition to our, our monthly programs at the historic home, which we rent from the, this is my father's home, it's now a national landmark near, uh, in, in Matawa. <clears throat> in addition to our, uh, our periodic programs, We'll have one downtown and have big ones downtown. We'll mm -hmm. have ones. Which I'm looking forward to attending. With, with Norm Ornstein on, on the midterm elections. But we also have uh, adopted an agenda for political reform, which is very, very, very comprehensive. And it addresses the root institutional causes of this political dysfunction, including 
the Electoral College, which needs to be abolished or reformed in the uh, uh, public information and engagement. The Federal Communications Commission needs to be uh, refor reformed. Campaign finance. We have to stem the flow of uh, money. One way to do that is by not having so many elected offices. <clears throat> I think in other countries, um, I'm not, there, you know, I don't know if it was England or what have you. I think the most, I, I think it's England. You can, or maybe Canada. I'm not sure, but you could only spend uh, twenty five hundred. Every candidate can spend up to twenty five hundred dollars, and that money they could go if they take a television ad or whatever they want to do, but they, everybody has the same uh, size pocketbook that they could spend. They can't spend any more, so you don't get these million dollars that are <coughs> donated by all these different uh, organizations and people that have been putting a lot of money into, like George Soros or the Koch brothers and, you know, all these multi-millionaires, uh, I should say multi-billionaires probably, are putting, are funding certain candidates, which is not fair because some of the ones that are really good, they don't get the funding, so they don't win. And if everybody had the same amount of money, that would be perfect. Then the candidate will, you the person that sounds the, you know, that, you know, that sounds the most, um, you know, that they can do for the people that can really focus in on the people and the, the, what they want, the people need their needs before their own. Well, remember the uh, Europeans also have parliamentary systems. They don't have presidential con contests. They have parliamentary elections and the parliament uh, picks the, prime, the uh, prime minister, so far less money, much shorter campaigns, and you end up with, for example, universal health care with far better results uh, at far less cost. There's more integrity in the politics and less money in the politics of these uh, countries. I, the only thing I'm a little bit concerned about, which I think we do need a universal health care system, the only thing that I'm concerned about I know right now, I'll go to my rheumatologist, he gives me between seven and 10 minutes of his time, and that is it. <coughs> and one day, he left the room saying, it was good seeing you, he taught, you know, and, then, and I said, wait a minute, doctor, I think you forgot something. And he said, what did I forget? I said, you forgot to examine me. And he said, oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm concerned about- I thought you were gonna say, I, yeah, yeah. forgot you. <laughs> I'm concerned about, with the universal health Care, and I think everybody needs it. I mean, because I think, you, you know, people would be less contagious, you know, people, health would be much better. But, you know, they, but they're, what they're doing right now, unless you have a, a, a concierge doctor that gives you more time, uh, they're giving you such a short time of their, you know, they, they, they stay by the computer, type everything in, and really don't, you know, don't focus on the patient. And I'm concerned about if we have a universal uh, health care system, how that's going to add in this equation. Am I, or am I going to get two and a half minutes of his time rather than yeah. a seven-minute doctor? Well, just to judge from the results, you get more time from the doctors, apparently, in these other countries with universal systems. So they must, they must work it out so the doctors maybe don't have to take as many patients or less I patients? Don't, I don't know. I, I don't, don't either, know. see? And that's what I'm concerned about because right now the way the healthcare system works is that the doctor has to see a new patient I think every 15 minutes so he gets 10 minutes with you and then he moves on for five minutes to add everything <coughs> to the computer about the patient and then he moves on to the next patient. So I think our medicine, um, you know, isn't, it, it, I, I don't know, I don't think they're practicing good medicine now, and I don't know what they're going to do if they, they have uh, universal health care. That has to be worked out. I know some countries have universal health care, and they have like a, you could, the person could buy a private uh, insurance policy if you want your MRIs or your, uh, your you know, other tests earlier if you want to get a knee replacement you don't have to wait months and months or a year to get it you can get it if you can afford a private policy on top of your universal mm -hmm. but they have to come up with a really good system but I do agree something has to be done and I don't think insurance companies are the people that should handle the health care right. 
So, and your other things, you know, you know, when we, you were when we were younger, and you know, they had when you were talking about uh, the media, we had people like John Cameron Swayze, Edward R. Murrow, Huntley <coughs> and Brinkley. I mean, and now we're getting in, uh, we're getting uh, uh, the National Enquirer type of media. Well, I can't, you know, tell you much because I don't know. I very rarely watch it. Because. I don't get much news from watching news on television. Now, there are some exceptions. I do watch WTTW occasionally. Uh, I sometimes listen to NPR, you know, and mm -hmm. driving. Uh, but watch television news, very, and very And Highland standard. Park Public Access, <laughs> we have really good news here. <laughs> and we really are, you know, we really, you know, really interview our people very well. We're sort of like the old Edward R. Murrow people here, and we get the, you know, different people, and we really get to learn about them. But I, I agree, we're getting 24-7 um, National Enquiry news, and it just keeps going on, the same news. You could turn the news on it in the morning at 8 o'clock, and you can listen to the same news at 8 o'clock at night, yeah. and the same news at 2 o'clock in the morning. You'll get the same thing, different people with the same, with the same uh, uh, news, which isn't news that's more or less uh, opinion, opinion news. A lot of it is opinion. Yeah, it's their opinion. And, <coughs> and what happens, I think, people take whatever they say verbatim. They think it's the real news. It's what you should believe in. And you, it gets all, <coughs> it, it, you don't know what to believe. If you turn on one station, you'll get the opposite opinion of the other station. So nobody knows what to believe anymore. Well, polls indicate the public does not have a high opinion on the whole of the media. Right. <coughs> So anyway, that's another uh, item that needs to be addressed. And you and said, and the you agenda. yeah, and you <coughs> said, um, you also said that they, you know, the electoral college. How can they abolish the electoral college? What, what would they need to do to abolish? Well, it would system? take a, <coughs> a constitutional amendment to abolish the electoral college, in favor of direct election. But there's an interim step that uh, we recommend. <coughs> States are passing legislation that requires all of their electors to vote for the winner of a national majority. But um, this compact does not take effect until states with a majority of electors have approved it. And I think 13 or 14 states plus the District of Columbia have uh, ratified it. But that would be a, a, an effective way of moving towards uh, the direct election of uh, the uh, president of the United, United States. I don't, th I don't think there's any other countries that have a, a electoral college. I think, no. pe uh, uh, like the, you know, all the other countries, they vote, uh, the people vote, right? It's what the people want, not what the, you know, I think, the, you know, when they elect, you know, in England and, and Israel and all the other countries, Germany, um, Italy, Greece, there's no electoral college. No, it's, what, it's, the pop, <coughs> it's the popular vote. Certainly in the developed economies. Here and I, and I think that's possibly why everybody's upset. I, I, I remember when, when um, President Bush II, uh, when he was elected over Gore with the hanging chad thing, and uh, with the same with uh, President Trump, Donald Trump, uh, you know, the popular vote, you know, people were angry because who they voted for didn't get in. They just, with the lecture, you know, just certain states made the decision of who won. And I think maybe this is why there's so much anger still out there, because the people feel that they got chipped. You mean in the last presidential yes. election? I think, uh, you know, uh, President Trump is an expression of anger, angst. It wasn't so much people voting for him, and only a minority did, as voting against what they perceived to be a, an elitism in uh, Washington. They're voting against, not so much voting for. And even so, uh, he lost the popular vote. They, they, they about three million uh, 
majority. Yeah, and so this is the first time we, <coughs> I don't know, and I, maybe you know, because you're just a tiny bit older than I am, um, <laughs> if they ever, you know, um, if this ever happened before, uh, the two would, you know, the, who else was voted in by the Electoral College? Was any of our presidents ever voted in besides um, the well, two? Well, you mentioned George W. Bush. Yeah, but besides I, those two. <coughs> I can't think of any other others offhand. But when you're, when you're um, great, when you're great, that's your great-grandfather, Adelaide one, and he became vice president um, under under Grover Cleveland. <coughs> How was politics then? Well, I'm not that old. I know. <laughs> but well, you, that gets but us back to, uh, this is contrarian, but the breakdown of party organization and responsibility. All of the great presidents were nominated by politicians, usually assembled in conventions. Mm -hmm. My first was in 1948, a convention a smoke-filled, dark room full of politicians. And they had those signs, <coughs> too, remember? <coughs> signs. There was a lot of enthusiasm. They debated serious issues. In that case, uh, it was uh, civil rights. And I remember standing beneath the uh, rostrum. I was a sergeant at arms. That was security in those days. Sergeant of arms. <laughs> yeah, a 17-year-old sergeant at arms. And uh, hearing a, an unknown mayor of Minneapolis candidate for the United States Senate uh, get recognized, and he made a fiery speech demanding that uh, all those politicians adopt a strong civil rights plank. And they did. And they drove the South out of. Uh, 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 out of the party. It was a hopeless year. But he campaigned hard all across the uh, country. And uh, my father was the Democratic candidate for governor here in Illinois. How, long, how long was he governor for? <clears throat> One term. One term. Did he um, want to run again, or he? He wanted to run again, but those politicians assembled again. And, uh, uh, and they drafted him for president. And of course, it was a hopeless year, 52, running against the returning war hero, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. The Democrats had been in power in the White House since 19... What was it, 30, 33, I guess. So he would have been better just staying as governor and ran again instead of getting drafted against... But the uh, party leaders, including Harry Truman, uh, wanted him to run, and he couldn't say no. He had to say, you know, yes, and then lose. Back in night, going back to 48, <coughs> When we had uh, straight ticket voting, you voted, you could vote a straight ballot, you know, for all the Democratic, all the Republican candidates. And uh, thanks to the straight Democratic uh, ticket, uh, Thomas Dewey was not elected president because Adlai Stevenson won by a huge majority and, and carried and helped with Paul Douglas, who was the candidate for the Senate, Democratic candidate. They carried Harry Truman to a narrow victory in Illinois and the country. Yeah, we've had, we had, on our show, we've had Clifton Truman Daniel. So we've had one of Harry's, uh, President Harry Truman's uh, grandsons uh, came on one of our shows, which was, you know, so I'm getting to meet all the, the presidents and the vice presidents. Uh, sons and <coughs> governor's sons and grandsons. It's beautiful, you know, to meet all of you. Now, you got elected and you became the senator, and you were senator for how many years? I was the uh, <coughs> state treasurer when uh, Everett Dirksen died. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I was elected in November 1970, 
and took my seat in the Senate almost immediately. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, I left the Senate voluntarily in 1981. So how many years was that? You were in the it was Senate? a little over 10 years. 10 years in the Senate. Do you feel that they should have um, term limits in the Senate? No. no. I don't believe in term limits. I don't think the people should be disenfranchised. They should be enabled, made, enabled to elect candidates qualified by service in uh, uh, you know, in public uh, office, uh, in the office that they're seeking election. Because I know they have term limits on the president, um, but they don't have term limits in the Senate or the House Let of Representatives. Let the people judge. So they, those term limits came about because people re-elected and re-elected and re-elected Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it was a good thing that they did, but they couldn't nowadays. I see. Cause if, if Mr. Trump wants to run again, let him run again and let the people judge. I have a feeling I know what their judgment will be, would be, if he runs, if he ser serves out one term. <coughs> but anyway, so you feel that there shouldn't be uh, term limits and people can judge for themselves. The only thing that I see some of the representatives do that the day after they get into office, they start. Uh, they start trying to make get money for re-election. Did you have to do that when you were, you know, the no, Senate? No, you know, they do that. Don't. They do that now, don't they? For some reason, they start working. <coughs> they start fundraising the moment they get into office. Well, you know, in our uh, our uh, agenda for political reform, we recommend four-year terms for members of the House, mm -hmm. so they don't have to continuously uh, raise uh, money. So if they have four-year terms, then they don't have to, that would be a good idea. And you know, I just want to, again, um, because we only have a couple of minutes left, you know, the Adelaide Stevenson Center for Democracy is a wonderful organization. They had uh, lectures like uh, the Real China Challenge updated. I see the electrical, the electoral college,